Hello everybody, I'm Rene Ramos, director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives, and this is Rewind, the show that looks back on Florida's past with historic film and video. It's time for another trip back into the past, so sit back, relax, and enjoy another episode of Rewind. It's a Sunday afternoon in Moscow, and here on Red Square, Thousands of tourists from all parts of the USSR and some other nations are acting like tourists anywhere in the world, going in and taking a peek inside the Kremlin walls. We find uh, detachments of uh, troops lined up, having their pictures taken, posing before the Kremlin wall and St. Basil's Cathedral. Совершенно верно. Строительство крупнопанельное, крупносборочное ведется по предварительно заготовленным на заводах сборным конструкциям. This is Russia, a special documentary presented by the 400 food fair stores serving millions of Americans throughout our country. Good evening. This is Ralph Rennick. Why make a journey to Russia? Our country is pitted in a very real life-or-death struggle with the Soviet Union. Churchill once described Russia as a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Russia and communism are things we know too little about. To fight something, you've got to know what you're battling. And thus, a trip to Russia might do some good in this regard. At least it could do little harm. With the thought that others in South Florida might feel the same way, I invited a group of South Florida business and professional men to join me on a tour behind the Iron Curtain. Forty-six of us traveled some 20,000 miles on the journey. This program tonight is a report on what we saw, what we did, and some conclusions as to what all of us can do as Americans to win this battle for survival. I would like to emphasize at the outset that it would be folly to pose as any sort of expert on anything based on two weeks behind the Iron Curtain. This is merely a report on the situation as we saw it. With that understanding, here now is tonight's program, This is Russia. First, let's take a look back in history in order to put today's Russia in proper perspective. These scenes were taken in 1917, just about 40 years ago, but conditions then were markedly different from today. The Tsar and the nobility ruled, owned, and controlled. We are somewhat surprised to see Russian women working today, but as you see, it's an old story with them. In 1917, Tsar Nicholas II found himself faced with a two-pronged dilemma. His armies were being crushed by the Germans, and the poverty, sick and thirst, were rebelling. The peasants' reason for moving to overthrow the Tsar was based more on hunger than on any high-sounding philosophy of Marx or Lenin. While the masses went hungry, the Tsar and his family enjoyed such pleasant pastimes as a gentle game of soccer. Or the more exhilarating sport of swimming without benefit of bathing suits. Finally, the army deserted the Tsar, and Nicholas was forced to abdicate. This left the field open to Lenin and the Bolsheviks, who rode into power on the hungry stomachs of the deceived peasants and serfs. Thus, the transition to communism occurred. In just 40 years, Russia has risen to become the second strongest military and industrial power in the world. Today, the people are not starving for food, but we shall learn but their diet of life is very lean in many other aspects, notably personal freedom. This is Leningrad today, the Russian version of Flagler Street. They call it the Nevsky Prospect. These are the sounds of Leningrad. 
The people look and act like dwellers in any big city. The people here express active curiosity toward our trip to Russia. Dr. Thomas Carney talked to one of them. No, no, uh, this is just uh, a goodwill tour that we're having for Miami, Florida, the people of Russia, to let them know what we look like and to find out what they look like. And I know a lot of the people here don't understand, and uh, if you would tell them what, what we are doing here, just to take pictures to show our people that all the children look to be the same, and the children are the, mostly the same. Why do, you know, why do you not have the interpreter? No, uh, we had an interpreter this morning, but uh, we didn't feel as if we wanted an interpreter this afternoon because we did not want to uh, uh, speak to the uh, to the people directly. Just take their, their pictures and look at their reactions, the same as, the same as we have at home. The people we saw everywhere were curious. Of course, we were equally curious. The Russians enabled persons in our group to visit and talk with their counterparts. For example, two pharmacists, John Stadnik and Samuel Jackson, visit this drugstore. They learn the Russians are starting to use tranquilizers in large quantities. Very little pharmaceutical research is done. But when a drug is produced in another country, the Russians waste no time in obtaining the formula. Drugs are government-made. There's no advertising, no false claims. In Russia, an aspirin, an aspirin. In a related field now, let's take a look at a hospital in Moscow. Hospitals are badly overcrowded. One reason for this is free medical care. At the hospital, photographer Lynn Pelham took advantage of that free care when he had a cinder removed from his eye. He offered to pay, but it was on the house. Following this minor operation, the chief surgeon explained that women doctors outnumber men doctors in Russia four to one. He told Dr. George Boucher there are two reasons for this. First, there are 17 million more women than men in the 30 to 45 year old age bracket because of high World War II casualties. Secondly, doctors' pay is quite low, starting salary about $1,200 a year and a good surgeon can look forward to only about $3,000 annually. Qualified men become scientists and engineers who can earn up to four times as much. Boucher, Dr. Carney, and others in our group put on surgical gowns and observed an intestinal operation for cancer. They noted the techniques were excellent in spite of the antiquated condition of the hospital building. It's about 25 to 30 years behind American hospital structures, not as sanitary either. The equipment, though, is good. One Russian official boasted that in Moscow alone last year, they spent $45 million on hospital operating costs. The figure sounds high, unless you happen to know that a single hospital in New York City alone spent three times as much. Here is a factory in Leningrad. This plant manufactures electronic equipment. There's a regulation in Russia prohibiting the taking of photographs in factories. My camera was left at the door. Later, the manager proclaimed there was no iron curtain separating Russia from the West. I asked the manager if I might be allowed thusly to retrieve my camera and take pictures for this program. This, I told him, would be partial evidence to an American audience that maybe no restrictive iron curtain existed. I got the camera. Here are the results. This plant was built in 1913. It's old looking, but inside, some 10,000 workers use assembly line techniques in turning out transistor tubes and other products. This is the manager who permitted the pictures to be taken. He said there are no strikes in the plant because it is owned by the state, which is the people. So he said the workers would, in effect, be striking against themselves. Most employees work seven hours a day, six days a week. Those workers who handle dangerous chemicals get a break. They work one hour less each day 
and are given free milk and lunch. In a park across the street from the factory, the women employees take a 40-minute lunch break. They utilize the weather to get some sun. The use of slogans, placing on bulletin boards of workers' pictures which exceed their output quotas, gives the employees incentive to produce more. The machines used in the plant were mostly Russian-made, according to George Brumlick, who said there were some old-style U.S. machines used also. Any worker absent without good reason appears before a court of his fellow workers, and punishment is handed out. In this system, one citizen is a spy on the activities of his neighbor. In stark contrast to that factory, is this 3,000-acre state experimental farm outside Moscow. Dairyman J. N. MacArthur reports that Russian farms and farming methods are not as efficient as is Soviet industry. 50% of all Russians work on farms in comparison with the American figure of 10% of the population. Women do a great deal of the work simply because there aren't enough men to go around. The workers are untrained. These are workers' houses. MacArthur says the cattle look good on this farm, but the crop's poor. There's plenty of land in the Soviet Union that's uncultivated. The country is land rich and labor poor. The emphasis in Russia now is on industry. As an example of this, last year, Russia bought $100 million worth of grain and wheat from Argentina and used heavy machinery as payment. There are rigid rules about workers' quotas on farms. They must be met each year. In her self-proclaimed race for the United States, Russia freely admits that farming is one of her select spots. But now Premier Khrushchev says he will give farming more attention. In the smaller farms, one half of the produce is turned over to the state. The rest can be sold by the farmer. And so free enterprise in the Soviet Union is not completely dead. The supermarket is non-existent in Russia. This is the typical market in Moscow. The farmer rents stall space. Restaurateur Art Bruns noted that everything is sold by the pound. Chicken, a dollar a pound, with feet and entrails extra. Dried apples, 60 cents a pound. Radishes, a dollar. Inferior grade meat, a dollar 40 cents a pound. Lemons, 25 cents a piece. Oranges, 40 cents each. There are no paper bags, and what's worse, by the American housewife's standard, there are no sale items. The Russian citizen works hard. His life is regimented. Does he have any fun? This is a beach at Leningrad, practically downtown, located across the river from the Winter Palace of the Tsars, the focal point during the Bolshevik Revolution. This beach, from the appearance of the brief bathing suit, resembles the French Riviera more than Russia where we are used to seeing people overclothed because of the cold weather most of the year. But on this day, the temperatures were in the upper 70s. The sun worshippers were out in force. Most of the people were young teenage couples, a few parents with their children. The sand was littered with debris. Although we were here without any interpreter, the sunbathers gave us a warm reception. Beaches for the daytime, but those people who have only evenings for entertainment go to the puppet show. You're looking at one now in Moscow. They also go to the ballet and concerts and circuses and to the movies. This unusual structural steel design is a television transmission tower. 
Moscow has two channels. Programs for both outlets come from the same studio building. All shows are produced by the state-owned TV facility. During the week, you can watch TV from 7 until 11 p.m. Physical culture shows, concerts, ballet, puppet shows, such as this one about a cat bookseller, our favorite. The man behind the desk is Nikolai Chapligin, head of broadcasting in Moscow. He told me there are 1,300,000 sets within range of the Russian capital. He also said the cheapest small screen set costs $200. A 14-inch screen sells for $850. Color television is just coming to Russia. 1,200 people work in TV alone in Moscow. There are 57 similar program centers in the Soviet Union. It was interesting to note that TV news shows contained mostly propaganda material. There were no spot news stories, no items about crime or government. It was like an Alice in Wonderland presentation. For those children too young to enjoy television, there are many parks scattered throughout Russia. The modern baby carriages and warm clothing indicate the importance the Soviets place upon the welfare of the younger generation. The parks also attract many young office workers, not all of whom are as playful as these two Moscow lovers. Throughout our entire stay in Russia, we encountered only one drunk. Or perhaps he was an unusually exuberant muscle bite. When a child is born to parents in Russia, the mother can either stop working or take a two-month vacation with pay and then return to her job. Most women return to work because it takes the combined income of husband and wife to pay for the necessities of life. Thus, the children are turned over to the state when babies. As they become older and attend state schools, they join the Young Pioneers. The next step is the Young Communist League, and finally, entrance into the Communist Party, the latter being an honor. Only about 3% of the USSR total population is made up of Communist Party members. But these youngsters, with their pliable minds, are being trained as the state dictates. Is there anything comparable to justice in Russia? Several lawyers and Dade Circuit Judge George Holt went to a people's court to find out. There is one such court for each 30,000 population. In Leningrad, there are 127 such courts with both civil and criminal jurisdictions. But only the district court and supreme court are empowered to hand down the death penalty. The judge seen here of this lower court sits on the bench with two people's accessories, which make it a three-judge tribunal. The judge here explains that some cases he hears are divorce, desertion of a family, and appeals from workers who are dismissed from their jobs. Attorney William Gaither was told that when a person is arrested, the state must accuse him within 48 hours. The arrested party may be held in jail for one month while the case is investigated. But if more time is needed, the prosecutor may ask the court to prolong the detention up to six months. While in jail, a person cannot have a defense attorney until the investigation is completed. There is no habeas corpus, and political crimes make it particularly rough on an individual. You're looking at the sprawling city of Moscow. Wide streets, few cars, many, many trucks. There are seven skyscrapers here, including Moscow University, a hotel, and apartment house seen there. But the Russians say they will build no more such structures. They are too impractical and expensive. Instead, construction design today provides no more than eight stories. Those are apartments. This project features prefab wall sections. We'll talk with the project engineer, the man responsible for this construction and those prefabricated sections. How long does it take you to construct one of these apartment housing units? Сколько времени потребуется для того, чтобы построить такое здание? Для того, чтобы построить такой дом, нужно три с половиной месяца. In order to build a building like that, it, need, it takes uh, three and a half months. Architect Robert Little noted there seemed to be very few skilled mechanics working on such projects. Again, most of the workers were women. Since there's no need to provide off-street parking because of the lack of cars, there's plenty of playground space for children around the apartment. There's Dr. 
Dr. Pearson, president of the University of Miami, was Jose Ferre. The Russian children, like American children, are great do-it-yourself addicts. They, too, realize the play value of a good, sloppy, old-fashioned mud pie. While touring this area, we received a rare invitation from a Russian family to visit their apartment. Small but adequate, an old-fashioned stove next to an up-to-date stainless steel sink. The large family was friendly and didn't seem to mind the crowded conditions. They, like other Soviet citizens, feel it's a temporary situation. Things will get better. They're not distressed by the poor construction, although they are aware of it and realize they can do better. This new building is, by our standards, crudely constructed. But the big objective now in Russia is just to throw up shelter. The Russians are just now realizing, too, the value of a shopping center rather than scattering stores throughout a housing project. Architect Little says there was practically no steel used in this construction because of a shortage of that product. There were slums to be seen. The Russian citizen, though, does his best to prevent photographers from taking pictures here. Apparently fearful that we will work the same propaganda trick with such pictures as the Russians do with U.S. slum pictures. And here's another view of the slums. What about hotels in Russia? This, for example, is my room in Leningrad. It was a suite that would have done even the czars proud. Here's the sitting room at the end of the entrance hall. Figurines, pottery, and paintings adorned the room. All the art objects had metal tag numbers attached to them with wire. Apparently a careful inventory check was kept. The beds were rather hard, but comfortable with two pillows and a quilt. Telephone service was unwieldy because of the language problem. There were double windows to keep out the winter cold. You could use the phone for room service, but you couldn't depend on speed. It took 15 minutes for the water to drain from this wash basin. Small cakes of soap were provided, as were drain stoppers, contrary to reports we heard prior to the trip. The bathtubs were large, a portable shower nozzle was attached to a hole. The hot water just wasn't hot. There was a trickle of warm water. This five-room corner suite even had a study, which came in handy for typing and compiling notes and shooting scripts. Remember, though, that this suite was the best to be had in Leningrad. The average hotel rooms provided are adequate, but not as fancy. We saw no new hotels being built. Uh, some of the reading material available in English here at the hotel. Uh, here's the Daily Worker, the United States edition, which is distributed uh, in Russia. And the big stories uh, here are in great detail. First, the story of the mutilation of the Negro lynching victim in Mississippi, and also a story of the strike at the textile mill in Henderson, the North Carolina. The entire newspaper is filled with similar material of this, of this type, all anti-United States and pro-communist. There's an English-speaking newspaper published in Moscow called the Moscow News, and this is not uh, quite so vehement against the United States, but merely um, outlines uh, news of Russian activity and uh, Russian officials in the continuing east-west conflict. While in Russia, the visitor is in the hands of Intourist, the government agency which handles all travel, lodging, and sightseeing arrangements. The visitor gets a financial break. He receives 10 rubles for each American dollar. The official rate of exchange is 4 rubles to the dollar. And so a dollar buys actually two and a half times more than the value received by the Russian citizen. But even so, things are not too cheap. The most inexpensive things I found were this doll. It sold for one dollar. And there was another type of doll you might be interested in, a wooden one which uh, breaks apart into a series of smaller dolls. This also sold for one dollar.
And these are Russian cigarettes. They are really half tobacco and half a long smokestack type of filter. If your doctor tells you to stay away from tobacco, these might be just the thing. The actual cigarette is only about an inch long. A two-inch chamber keeps it away from your mouth. There are no traffic jams either in Russia. There aren't enough cars. And the autos that are seen are almost, without exception, very clever imitations of American cars, like this Russian version of the Chevrolet. This car very strongly resembles the Packard, and it should, for it was pressed from Detroit-made dyes of the Packard. Auto dealer Anthony Abraham noted, there's an 18-month delay for any Soviet citizen wealthy enough to afford a car. The purchase price is only half the battle, though. It's a cash deal, no installment buying. Gasoline costs 60 to 65 cents a gallon. These were the in-tourist limousines we rode in. They were in excellent mechanical condition, but we noted the lack of white sidewall tires and radios. The Russians are masters at turning disadvantage into advantage. This magnificent building is the former summer home of Peter the Great. They hold it up now as a symbol of bourgeois decadence, point to it with pride and say, no one lives in it now, it belongs to the people. That's part one of This is Russia. In a moment, more about that country and a special report on the satellite peoples in Hungary and East Germany. down the square is a long queue of uh, people extending over a mile waiting to go in and view the bodies of Stalin and uh, Lenin. And they'll wait there a good many hours before they get in. There are soldiers here from, uh, we see the Chinese Communist Army, uh, the North Korean Army, and other uh, units around the world within the sphere of the satellite. And uh, now the time. The Kremlin Tower are tolling... 3.30, and a heavy drizzle is beginning to fall, and the people are now scattering for shelter. The story of religion in Russia can be found here in Red Square. St. Basil's Orthodox Cathedral has been turned into a museum. It's not a popular attraction for the people. These soldiers changing guard in the tomb of Lenin and Stalin are goose-stepping by the edifice which typifies the communist religious spirit. The people come from all parts of the Soviet Union to view the bodies of Lenin and Stalin here. Instead of worshiping God, Lenin is deified. This impressive building in Leningrad is the desanctified Kazan Cathedral, now an anti-religious museum. In other churches converted to museums, there is an admission charge. There is none in this museum. Paintings adorn the walls, showing richly clothed czars refusing peasants' requests for food. Standing alongside the czars are orthodox priests. The inference to the people, the church, sided with the nobility in keeping the serfs suppressed and starving. The object is to show the people how much better off they are with communism and without religion. The Soviet suppression of religion has been carried out with machine-like efficiency. In Moscow, the fifth largest city in the world, with five million people, there is but one Roman Catholic church, one Baptist, one Jewish synagogue, and several Russian Orthodox churches. Here, Sunday Mass is being held in the Catholic Church. The only priest is suffering from a serious ear infection. Communism is atheistic. There is no way in which belief in God and belief in communism can be compatible. But the state allows a few churches to remain open. It is a facade to avoid criticism if the churches were snuffed out entirely. Looking around this church, 
you see practically all old women who had professed belief in God before the 1917 revolution. There were no middle-aged or young Russians, with the exception of some children who were brought by their grandmothers. On this Sunday, there were three baptisms in the sacristy of the church. The government does not encourage attendance, and the young Russian trying to get ahead under the Soviet system soon finds that attending church is a black mark on his record. There are between two and three million Jews in Russia, with only 60 rabbis. There are no Jewish theological schools, no facilities for printing prayer books, and no communication between synagogues. Some observers say the Jews are convenient scapegoats for the Russians, just as they were for the Nazis. Religious education as a faith is prohibited for children below the age of 18. Once they reach 18, the young Soviets may receive such education in groups not exceeding three students. These youngsters are lined up in Red Square, rehearsing for an athletic event to be held in the stadium. Some smiled for the camera and giggled. Others maintained frozen, impassive faces. With these youngsters, it's a case of body over soul. It's not just the health of the citizen that concerns the Russian leaders. They're instilling within their youngsters the spirit of competition. It is with this spirit of group competition that the Russians hope eventually to raise their living standard above ours. They hope to outproduce it, to take over our world trade market, and to thus accomplish by simple economics what would be too costly to accomplish by open warfare. In Russia, we were impressed with the complete state control over mines, souls, materials, business, commerce, and every other facet of life. There was little wasted time or energy, although there was resultant waste from the inferior ways of doing things. The Russian people were not unfriendly to us. They were as interested in us as we were in them. Regarding the United States, the Russian people haven't heard both sides of the story. Their knowledge of us is a frightened mixture of truth, half-truth, and untruth. Thus, visits by Americans to Russia will do much to bring the other side of the story over the Soviet border. Speaking of borders, on our way out of the Soviet Union, we went through customs in Kiev, in southeastern Russia. You're looking at this photograph of the customs house. A guard told us that we could not take out of Russia films taken there. He said this was not allowed, that only amateur pictures could be taken out. We had about 150 rolls of unexposed film. At this point, this slip of paper came in handy. It's a page from Premier Khrushchev's calendar. He tore it out, put his autograph on it, and gave it to him. When this signature was waved under the custom man's nose, and it was explained that some of the film was in the meeting we had with the Premier, we were ushered from the room without the film or any other baggage being checked further. Then it was on to the next destination. What you have just seen is a random sampling of a few of the observations made during our stay in Russia. In a few moments, we'll see Budapest, East Berlin, and West Berlin. When most people think of Russia, that thought includes her satellites. In many ways, we are correct in lumping the Soviet Union and the Soviet satellites together. In many ways, we are wrong. There is a marked difference between the attitudes of the people of Russia and, for example, Budapest. You saw rather cheerful, industrious people in the country we are leaving. The Russian people are united in a common effort, willing to make a few sacrifices in order to achieve a standard of living comparable to ours. But the people of the satellite countries resent making similar sacrifices for the Russians. They don't mind doing it for their own government, but those governments have turned into puppet regimes. 
And thus, the spirit of the people is not one of dedication to the state, but rather oppression and fear. This is a panorama of the twin cities of Buda and Pest, capital of Hungary. The buildings line the bank of the Danube River, which splits Budapest in half and separates the city. This is a city of contrast. The people here are under the communist form of government, but have demonstrated their hatred for the Russians who rule with an iron fist. In the fall of 1956, that pent-up emotion broke loose with a fury. Our group from South Florida is lined up on the steps of the cathedral, the church of Joseph Cardinal Mincenti. Until recent weeks, the U.S. State Department has refused permission for Americans to enter Hungary. We were among the first to obtain visas. Budapest, once the city of gaiety, was for us not a happy place. There is an aura of fear present in this city. It is not pleasant to witness. That fear results from what happened three years ago, the fall of 1956, and the revolution that shook the very walls of the Kremlin. For a few brief days, the people of Hungary were free from the Russians. They stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with their masters and slugged it out. We all know how it ended. The Russians came back with their tanks and snuffed out the brief spark of revolt that had erupted into a flame seen round the world. Cardinal Mincenti is freed by the rebels during the uprising. He had been arrested by the communists in 1949, charged with treason, espionage, and blackmail, handed a life term. Why did the uprising occur? Budapest communist officials told me not everyone was ready for the people's democracy. Also, the fascist remnants in Hungary tried to regain power, but the party leaders pushed the people too much. The uprising was directed against their act and not against the communist regime. Also, the party itself was split into factions. It couldn't effectively lead the people. Hungarian refugees in this country said the reasons for the revolution were personal insecurity, affronts to individual dignity, and a humiliation of the national ego. Those were the most important reasons for their fight. An American official in Budapest said the people tried to throw off the Russian yoke so they could have a government like Yugoslavia. This today is the scene in Budapest. I'm standing by that park where much of the fighting occurred in the scenes you just saw from 1956. Most of the red stars have been put back on the building. The monuments have been restored. But here and there, the scars are missing and the Russian symbols have not been put back on their granite bases. It is a marked contrast, though, to the fighting. We cannot deny that the Hungarians hate Russian rule enough to die in an effort to throw it off. It was only a hurry-up call to the Russian army that brought today's uneasy peace. You see some Russian troops in downtown Budapest, but the main units are stationed in towns 30 and 40 miles away. They remain on the perimeter, ever ready to move in again if they are needed. The Hungarian Chamber of Commerce members told us they would like to trade with the United States. They defended the communist system and were openly frank about criticizing the U.S. free enterprise system, even though we chatted at a social affair as invited guests. Private enterprise does exist here in rare instances. A government spokesman told me that only private craftsmen could turn out orthopedic shoes, also watch repair and corset makers. He said we wouldn't dream of nationalizing them. The job of patching over places like this is immense. There are hundreds of thousands of such scars on buildings in all parts of the city. War and fighting has a very real meaning to these beleaguered people, whose geographic location for centuries has placed them under the rule of the strongest nation in East Central Europe. There are patches on walls, but these seem to make the bullet scars look even more graphic. It's difficult to erase the history of this city.
This is the Killian Barracks, the scene of the heaviest fighting during the revolution in 1956. The building today has been transformed into a hotel, a transient hotel, where people live who are being put out of housing, which is being torn down to make way for new housing. Most of the exterior of the building has been reconstructed, and the scars are gone. You see in the distance the scaffolding around the remaining parts of the Killian Barracks where there is evidence of the extreme fighting during the revolution. The bitterest fighting of the 56th revolt occurred here. And while the exterior of the building is being reconstructed, it is like a Hollywood movie set. The interior scenes still show the devastation suffered during the ferocious hand-to-hand -hand combat between the die-hard rebels and the Russian soldiers. I asked permission from the construction foreman to take photographs. He said okay, and was most agreeable to filling me in on information, most of which turned out to be accurate. Women were very evident in the workforce here too, mixing cement, pushing wheelbarrows. There was a shortage of manpower. The nation also suffered heavy losses in World War II. My brother Dick used some fast talk and plenty of ingenuity in order to obtain these next films. He's standing in front of the American legation in Budapest with a Russian soldier behind him who had just ordered him not to take any films of the building. Not wishing to lose the story, Dick made a fast sales pitch, and here are the results. This is the most heavily guarded building in the city, the American legation. Both soldiers and plainclothes secret police are at the entrance around the clock. The reason? Cardinal Mincenti, who escaped from communist clutches during the revolution, is living in the building in this apartment. He is being granted asylum by the United States. It's a ticklish problem, and the U.S. officials here will not let any outsider talk with the Cardinal for fear of further aggravating things. A government spokesman said the Cardinal was a bigger problem for the U.S. than for them, but they had no interest in it but the armed guard watches the legation 24 hours a day to make sure the cardinal doesn't try to flee the country. The communists may not be making in variety, quality, or quantity the products made in the free world, but what they do make, they like to show off. The Russian exhibit at the Budapest Fair is a prime example of the workings of their propaganda machine. This Russian car is one that many Americans would perhaps be happy to own. Since it's on display at the fair, the natural assumption of the uninformed Hungarian is that Russia is mass-producing such vehicles. There wasn't a single such auto observed on the streets we saw in Russia. The Soviet farm exhibit also drew many envious glances. But on the state experimental farm, outside Moscow, there wasn't a single piece of similar equipment to be seen. In all fairness, we must admit we saw only a few farms in Russia, but it would be a reasonable assumption that they would try to keep their best foot forward by showing us their better agricultural centers. Budapest, once a gay city, was now a gray city. It was interesting to contrast the change under communism of an existing city to the change evident when a city has to be rebuilt from the rubble heap under Russian rule. From Budapest, we travel to East Berlin. The first Russian tank to enter Berlin in World War II has been preserved as a monument, perhaps to serve as a constant reminder of the downfall of Hitler. Everywhere in the Soviet sector of Berlin, the scars of war are still visible. Much of the rubble will never be cleared. Again, to remind the Germans of what happened the last time they had visions of world conquest. The bunker where Hitler committed suicide and where his body was burned has not been touched. There are no plaques or markers identifying the spot. East Berlin is not a happy place. 300 people every day slip into West Berlin to escape the communists. Russian troops are seen everywhere. These are rare close-up views. If the Western powers leave West Berlin, it would mean turning 2 million people over to the communists. 
The face of West Berlin differs so sharply from that of East Berlin that the transition from one to the other is such. Here in the Western sector, life goes on much as it would in any comparable American city. There's a moving, dynamic tempo, a chatter of animated conversation, bustling traffic, which includes automobiles from all parts of Europe. Stores and shops have a wide variety of merchandise, not just on display, but for sale to the average West Berlin citizen. The people are well-dressed in comparison to East Berlin, Budapest, and Russia. Streets and buildings are clean and free from rubbish. Reconstruction has been rapid. There are churches with no fear of ostracism in return for attending a house of worship. And there's nightlife. If the communists move in, all this would change radically. The Berlin crisis, in a nutshell, boils down to this. Soviets have promised the East Germans a unified Berlin. If the Western powers don't move out, the Russians will lose faith. They'll be accused of not being able to deliver the goods. But it would be a serious blow to our prestige if we were to vacate West Berlin and sacrifice those people. Here are four good reasons why the West Berlin populace wants the Western powers to remain in their city. There are, of course, other reasons. But these four models typify the spirit and feeling of that city. And their models, one luxury not normally found behind the Iron Curtain. They symbolize an awareness of beauty, poise, and attractive appearance. For individuals, free to come and go, free to quit their jobs, free to leave the city, free to earn money according to their ability, not according to a quota or similar state required. The atmosphere present in the countries of Eastern Europe, which has fallen under the Russian yoke, is entirely different from that found within the Soviet Union itself. In Russia, the people by and large are cooperating and supporting their government, but in Hungary and East Germany, the people are living under an imposed form of oppression. Their nationalistic feelings are offended. There is resentment against Russia. So now, in conclusion, where do we go from here? You've seen some pictorial examples of grassroots Russia, also Hungary and East Germany. To conclude this program, Let's hear from both sides, the United States and the USSR. En route to the Soviet Union, Vice President Nixon talked to us off the cuff for some 40 minutes. He displayed a comprehensive knowledge of communism and what we should be doing about it. Nixon compared the burst of industrial enterprise in Russia today to the United States period of expansion from 1850 to 1900. The Soviet system is less efficient than ours, he said, but when you pit an aggressive force against a static force, the former usually wins. We should recognize the Russian economic threat, said Nixon. In 40 years, Russia has become the second industrial and military power in the world. Once we recognize this, we need to stimulate among American citizens the same spirit that has characterized Americans when we have been confronted with emergencies in the past. Nixon said we shouldn't meet the communists solely on their own ground, that we have something more to offer the world other than production and military power. We have spiritual ideals and values, and we have freedom along with progress. People want progress, said the vice president, but they prefer it with freedom. On April the 29th, I wrote this letter to Nikita F. Khrushchev, premier of the Soviet Union. The purpose of the letter was to request a meeting with it. One Tuesday, while arriving in Red Square to visit the tomb of Lenin and Stalin, the in-tourist guide excitedly rushed up with the news that the meeting with the top man would occur in two hours. There was little difficulty entering the Kremlin and the room where the meeting was to take place. However, a check was made to make sure that only members of our Florida group were admitted. No outsiders were allowed. No other newsmen. It was very much like a private conference. Nikita Khrushchev could probably claim the title of world's best super salesman. He can turn on charm and show anger, express concern and bring forth laughter, all with apparent ease. Upon first meeting, you are impressed with Khrushchev's physical appearance. He is a short man, very stocky. His clothing suggests a man who in Russia 
would perhaps be manager of a factory. Despite reports that he might be suffering from serious disease, Khrushchev looked the picture of health. He was tanned, appeared relaxed, gave the impression that he had no other item of business other than meeting with us. In accepting a key to the city of Miami, Khrushchev said the Soviet Union would not misuse the key and will enter our city only with permission, as cultured and polite people do. As he spoke, it was difficult to believe that this short, stocky man with small eyes and a ready smile was the person who held the most powerful post in the world today and controlled the fate and destiny of millions of people. Khrushchev alleged that Russia would not start a war. He said his country was relying on rockets, not bombers, as protective devices. He said the U.S. was behind Russia in missile development. You will catch up to us, said the Premier, but in the meantime, he said, we will not do any Russian snow. Khrushchev said he would rather compete with us in other fields, such as improving the standard of living. Regarding communism overtaking capitalism, he said, who can guarantee that your grandchildren, years from now, will have the same views you do? Who is to be the judge between the two systems, he said? Let us live and see. See by our actions which system can better supply housing, food, and clothing, and other human needs. If capitalism is more able to supply these needs, then communism can never triumph. The bacilli of communism, he said, will enter the minds of our grandchildren. As I stressed before, I'm no expert on Russia or international relations. But it seems to me the challenge to us as Americans is clear. We can win out with our superior system. But we have to recognize that we are engaged in a war with Russia. A psychological, ideological, and economic war. Knowing what communism is is important. We've won the shooting wars in the past with everybody unselfishly pitching in to save our democracy. It's going to take some pitching in on all our parts to win this one. You've got to start somewhere, and South Florida is as good a place as any. To win, I believe we've got to get rid of a negative and condemnatory attitude which seems to be the vogue today. It's not how good a job a man in public office is doing, but the fact that he's in office must mean he's looking out for his own interests, not the public. This is an unfair assumption. If he's doing a good job, tell him so. Encourage you. We should believe that there is a greater abundance of good prevalent here in America than bad. And do everything in our part to eliminate the bad. For a change, we should look out for our country and community first, and our own selfish interests second. Speak out when it's called for Exercise leadership in your neighborhood. We've got the best system of government ever devised by man. Freedom, like fresh air, is a God-given thing to enjoy. To win the battle, we've got to support our system to the hilt. Shout about it from the housetop. And with the help of God, show Mr. Khrushchev that the bacilli of communism he talked about won't have any effect here. We show by our personal example and effort that we have immunized our community and our nation against the bacilli of communism. The challenge is clear. It's up to us. We need to rededicate ourselves to actively demonstrate that thing that we call the American spirit. That's about it for this edition of Rewind. Just time to remind you that Rewind features historical film and video from the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. To see more from the Wolfson Archives collections, visit our website, wolfsonarchives.org. You can search the archives catalog and watch video online. And be sure to connect to our YouTube channel, 
where you will find hundreds of carefully curated clips or link to the Wolfson Archives Facebook page to keep up with our busy calendar of historical happenings. Until next time, I'm Rene Ramos. Thanks for watching. Oh, 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 oh.